Four game sweep with two overtime wins, one one nothing game, and the series ender with four seconds left. Going back further, 11 and one in their last 12, nine of those one goal wins. Here's the debate of the day. Are the Florida Panthers on a great fortune filled run or the most clutch team ever? Great question, Tom. <laughs> we'll get to that in a second. Heat Celtics game five. Boston favored by anyone? Anyone know what the line is? Eight. Eight. Don't yes, care. that is correct. Eight. Don't care. That is also correct, Bob Rye. There we go. Uh, <laughs> so this series going from Boston overwhelming favorite to start to down 0-3 and completely broken to one win. And now back home in an eight-point favorite. It's whiplash like uh, Miles Teller here. Bob Ryan, around the horse to you. What's more likely to happen tonight, Heat closing it out or Celtics taking it back to Miami? Well, I, I don't care whether it's eight or 18 or 108 or, or yeah. minus two. Celtics, I'm with you. <laughs> I, I think we'll win tonight. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to build off what they uh, started to construct in the last game and play more like the team that we know they can be. Look, my belief, and I've said it to you before, and I'll say it for the 100,000th time, they're the most talented collection of basketball players on this planet. However, they are the most unreliable collection of good basketball <laughs> okay. players yeah. on this talent, on this tr planet. And, and uh, they have, there's no reason to have faith that they will come up big tonight other than to know how good they can be. They have, they have something to prove. I thought they had proven it after Game 7 in Philadelphia, with Philadelphia. Well, that wasn't true. That was a false positive. So we have to go again. But I, I think they, if, they play, if everybody, they play their A-minus game, they'll win tonight. All right. Monica McNutt, are you with Bob Ryan there? Who you got tonight? I do think that the Celtics pull this one off tonight, but I don't know about an A-minus game getting it done. In terms of fortuitous bounces in their favor, the absence of Gabe Vincent, I think, is something that the Heat are going to have to work through. But this thing, to me, is about the Celtics' ability to defend and play some defense. I know, when they shoot the three ball well, 40%, they have a tremendous record in that instance. But they've also got to stop this Heat team from hitting threes, which they were able to do in Game 4, because prior to that, they were shooting 48% from the three on their own, and Gabe Vincent was a big part of that. Okay, but that's two now believing Boston can get this tonight and take it back to Miami. Click in, Kevin Blackstone. Who you got tonight? Well, I kind of like the team that's won 75% of these playoff games in this series so far. I mean, you know what? The Heat had an off game, and Boston had one on game. They are 4-5 and five in the postseason at home, are the Celtics. So back to Bob's point, very unreliable, um, but they are what they are. And I just think that when you look at one thing in particular in this series, the coaching matchup, Eric Spolstra has a big advantage over Missoula. And we all know that, and we've seen some, we've seen some things break out there. But, I, you know, I think that what, what Monica said about playing defense, they were able to run some guys off the three-point line. They didn't shoot 40% like they had been doing all along. Can Boston do that again? I'm just not so certain, and I'm just don't, not so certain that the Heat won't play as they've played in the first three games. So there's one for Miami. And David Dennis Jr., your turn. Over the last three seasons, the home, t uh, the home teams between the Heat and the Celtics are 6-15. and 15. The home team, right? there's no home court advantage <laughs> wow. between these two teams. Great the stat, Celtics dude. played one really, really great game in Miami, mostly because they were hitting threes. Miami has just been outplaying them all of the other games. And so we can talk about, you know, this improbability of the Celtics coming back and all these things and what they're doing. But for some reason, with the Heat, whenever they lose a player, they seem to get better. So we could be worried about <laughs> game six, but they seem to play better when somebody yeah. gets hurt. So I think that Miami, you know, took yeah. the Boston's best shot in game four, and I think they're going to win tonight. Adding another and getting better, David. We call that a Boltron situation. You with me? You're my age, all right? <laughs> Bob Ryan, back right. to you on the... <laughs> Fickle nature of this team at home. Can you explain that? Why, why aren't they winning postseason games in Boston anymore? No one can explain it. It was a topic of conversation uh, going into the tournament and, and, and in the playoffs, and it means more of one so than ever. No one can explain it. Their indifference and their inability to take advantage of the home court. No okay. one can. No, there no, no, no. seems to be an energy, though, maybe more in this matchup than previously when a team's been up 3-0 or down 0-3, that... 
This could happen, isn't that right, Bob? Bob, it's 0 and 150. You know how many got to even in Game <laughs> Seven? There have been none that have been close. <laughs> Three. It's already been stated that the Celtics were prohibitive favorites to win the series, so that's why people are a little confused in some degree. Now, I'm going to say so. It's 150 and 0 when you're on 0-3. Yeah. However, one time it was it was so very close to being done. The first time in 1951, the Knicks were down 0-3 to the Rochester Royals. They <laughs> won the next three, happens. and with one minute to go in Game <laughs> Seven in Rochester, the score was tied. The ball was brought up court by Bobby Davies, the Hall of Famer. He was met by Tricky Dick mm. McGuire. There was a collision. <laughs> Referee blows the whistle. The world awaits the decision. Block or charge? Okay. He okay. goes, ah, it was a block. Davies goes to the line, makes both free throws, and they eventually win that game. It was a four-point game, but it was really a two-point game. So you're telling That's me it's never happened before. The, doing it. the closest this come was the first time ever when the game was oh, in wait. Rochester. Hello, <laughs> David. Monica, how great was that? <laughs> I don't have nothing. I was going to say the same thing. I was going to talk about the yeah, same thing. Yeah, right. I Tricky remember Dickie fondly. McGuire. Yeah. Dick McGuire, one of the all-time yeah. greats in the history of this sport. All right. So that's. So I've got Ryan and McNutt, Boston, Blackstone, Dennis, Miami. We'll move on. The Florida Panthers. How are they doing this? Matthew Kachuk just crushing the soul of Carolina. Look at this. The game winner and series ender with four seconds left on the power play after that Jordan Stahl penalty was called. Again, Florida, 11-1 in their last 12 games, nine of them by one goal. They were the last team in the playoffs, effectively the eighth seed here as well. Carolina coach Rod Brindamore said this was so close it wasn't a sweep. <coughs> As his team was swept out of the playoffs. <laughs> what? Whiplash like Indiana Jones there. Kevin Blackstone. The debate of the day. Are the Panthers on a great fortune-filled run? Or are they the most clutch team ever? Well, it might be a little bit of both. And one thing I think that we've forgotten is if we go back a year ago, the Florida Panthers were right at, at that spot where the Bruins are, yeah, right? Yeah. I mean, they were the they right, had the president's trophies. They were the they were smoking through the uh, th smoking through the league, and then they got to the postseason and fell off a cliff. Um, so now maybe they figure something out, like everyone does. The regular season not so important. Whoo! Just got into the playoffs, and now they're playing their best their best hockey of the year, obviously. And and look how they won that game last night. Going back to to Chuck Kachuk, once again. It's his third game winner. And he was wide open on that. How did no one put a body on him? That was incredible. So I think it's a little okay, bit of both. So you say a little bit of team. both, and I say mute. Save a little bit of both for your classroom, <laughs> Professor. This is around the horn. The game of competitive banter. David Dennis Jr., is this an all-time <laughs> luck-filled run, all these one-goal games and one-goal wins, or the most clutch team ever? Uh, since I have to choose between one of those, most clutch team ever. This team is only the third team in NHL history to be three out of the top four teams in the playoffs. And we could talk about Kachuk and his shots, and you can call those fluky if you want. But you know what's not fluky is Bobrovsky and that goal play that he's been doing. He allowed six goals in four games, 96% save mark. The only He's had the most saves in a four-game sweep in NHL history. That is not something that's fluky. That is not luck. That is somebody rising to the occasion in a four-game sweep. Monica McNutt, all-time run? Or really, are we talking about a team maybe the most clutch you've ever seen? I'm leaning in, Tony. I, too, am going most clutch. And I know you mentioned the 11 of 12, Mark. But when you look at those 11 wins, nine of them have been one goal <laughs> victories. And so this is a team similar to the previous conversation. But I'm not making a correlation, so don't take away points. They're comfortable when things are ugly. They bet on themselves, and they're able to figure it out. Bob Ryan. Well, you know, if you go back to the 1933 Stanley Cup. <laughs> I was ready. I was like, of course. <laughs> A couple things have happened. Two people. We moved two people and the series is over and the hurricanes are, are going on. One is Bobrovsky, as, as D David has said. Who, you always have a, need a goalie standing on his head, as they say, mm -hmm. to be this good at, in the playoffs. They've got him. He's going. All those goose eggs mean something. But Matt Kachuk is playing like a combination of Ovechkin and Crosby and maybe throw in Rocket Richard and Bobby Orr. I mean, this is an amazing clutch performance. So if you want to go with the word clutch, Tony, we'll center on one man, Matthew Kachuk. Yeah, okay. Still, you got
got to finish the deal, right? <laughs> this is just getting to the Stanley Cup final. They still got to finish the deal. There's one more debate to be had here. The Panthers now in the final as an eight seed. The Heat one game away from the finals as an eight seed. David, does this year prove the regular season matters less? Or is it an aberration? No. This is an aberration. We are at with Kachuk and Butler, two all-time playoff performances that are not really replicable. I would not encourage any other team to treat the regular season like they don't matter. Kevin Blackstone? It's an aberration in the NBA. It's not an aberration in the NBA. We'll have that be the last word. Buy or sell next. Welcome back to Around the Horn, brought to you by Chase. Coming to you from the Seaport District at Pier 17. Could the NBA be on the cusp of admitting it has a flopping problem? Sham Charania, a report that the competition committee will look into in-game penalty for flops this summer and test it out in the summer league, and that that would result in a technical foul free throw in the game. And yes, what you're seeing here is our greatest hits of flops. <laughs> now, this is what I call flops 23, is, is what we're calling this. David, does <laughs> buy or sell? <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm selling this. The last thing we need is referees litigating more amorphous calls and telling us what a flop is. Whatever happened to the fines that were supposed to come? We're doing flops. And what, like what? we charges and and you know uh, fouls, all that stuff. They're just wasting time because they don't know what these actual things are. So you're gonna stop the game and try to tell me if somebody is flopping or not. This is just gonna waste time, and heaven forbid if this becomes something that we review and challenge and take even more time out so of. So you're game. selling, Kevin Blackstone, buy or sell. David, when you sit at home and watch an NBA game, you know very well that you point out every time, that's a flop, that's yes. a flop. They need to get this out of the game. They do need to get it out of the game. Nobody cares about writing a paycheck. Make it cost your team something on the floor, mm -hmm. and you watch those flops get out of the game. So you're buying the NBA Absolutely. trying to get this, get arms around it in the middle yeah, of a game. for with athletes. It's not for Thespians. Monica, buy or sell. <laughs> I usually am super pro player, but I am buying this one because it has gotten a little out of hand, the dramatics and the antics. I also think that this is something that's similar to what we've seen this year with the take file. Guys will just decide it's not even worth messing with it, right? And I do think, to David's point, if it's egregious enough and a team feels confident, don't forget if they do use that challenge, they're going to lose that timeout. So they got to feel really strongly, which I don't think a lot of well, coaches are going to go the NFL. Just be You like, want the NBA out. to drill down here? change the rule for technical free throw for flopping. Bob Ryan, buy or sell? All, I'm, I'm uh, selling. All referees are not created equal, and some are more intelligent to adjudicate this than others. But I covered the most famous vigilanteism ever when Dave Cowens, angered because Mike Newland had taken a second sure. flop on him in the game, knocked him on his rear end, <laughs> ran over to referee Bill Jones and said, now that's a foul. Now that's, okay. <laughs> By the way, let me let, let me let, let, let's go back around the horn here. 1951 finals. Was it a block charge or a flop by Tricky Dick McGuire? That's the question everybody wants to know. Enough. Was that game even on TV, Bob? Uh, I, I, lucky it was on radio. <laughs> I don't even think we had TV. We'll move on. Let's check in on the Baltimore Ravens now. It's been one practice. <clears throat> And this is what Lamar Jackson is saying, that he's loving the looks of the Ravens' new offense under new coordinator Todd Munkin, and that he expects less running and more passing this year. Debate this, Kevin Blackstone. What's better for Lamar and the Ravens? More passing and less running, or more running and less passing? Well, when you talk about that 90 yards per game mark, right, when, when Lamar hits that, it's better if they're over that than they win, 16 to 1. But the question here is whether or not he should be doing more running than, than as well as passing. And we know that when you run, your chances of getting hurt um, hurts your team, it hurts him, it hurts everything. That's why the contract negotiations were so protracted, right? Because he's a guy who got hurt all of a sudden. Keep him healthy. So should they be passing more? Is that what I'm, that, that's what you're buying here? That, that the Ravens They should, should be passing more. That doesn't necessarily mean they should be passing significantly more than he's okay, running. But more. Just, you have to pair it back. Monica, should they be passing more? Uh, I do think they should be passing more. I don't think that the issue is Lamar Jackson as a passer. The issue has long been 
who he was passing to. And I, maybe I'm a little altruistic here, but I buy that giving Odell Beckham Jr. some time to prepare for the season and a true offseason will help him get back to form. Odell, Nelson Aguilar, pass the ball. Let's see what happens. Lamar's legs still work. He will do that when he needs Bob to. Bob Ryan, where are you in this debate? Well, I'm the Lamar Jackson has been the biggest game plan nightmare for Odell, defensive coordinators in the league. And all across the league, DCs are going to be going, oh, boy, go, bring it on. Let's see you. See how well you can throw the ball. Okay. 30, all right. So you think opposing teams touchdowns want it. last year and, and 20 interceptions. Yeah, go ahead. Throw more. We like it. Mm. David Dennis Jr. What's best for Lamar and the Ravens to be in an offense that is running more like they have been historically or passing more, which looks to be the looks of Munkin right now? Lamar Jackson has a 104 QBR when he has a clean pocket, so he can decimate defenses when he's passing. But let's not forget, this guy's the first quarterback to 1,200 rushing yards, first quarterback with two 1,000-yard rushing seasons. You can pass a little bit more, but you cannot make him a one-dimensional quarterback and abandon that run because that is what makes him the weapon that he is. That's what get him the, gets him the MVPs. So incrementally, you can increase that passing, but you still got to leave that running as an option. I'm just happy that Lamar Jackson is talking talking about football with the Ravens and not sure sure it's been one practice but right love this offense one practice in it looks right. like a dream we'll move on buy or sell three <laughs> NFL's <laughs> highest paid quarterbacks you know the list here and you know you can see who's number seven Patrick Mahomes he was number one three years ago and this week he was asked about what he thinks about other quarterbacks getting ahead of him and he said his focus and worry is more on winning and legacy and not what other quarterbacks are making. Here's the full quote. Monica, buy or sell that? Um, I'm going to buy it, Tony, but it's pretty easy to buy when the totality of your contract still has you leading the clubhouse. Yeah. And so I, have I a get billion? where Patrick yeah. Mahomes is coming <laughs> from. Yeah, but he's like already paid, so there's no sweat on his end. But I will say I had a coach who said this to me, and it's something that I still live by. Chase the passion and the money will come. And that's happened in his case. Bob Ryan. I want to believe that take him at face value. I want to believe. I've always wanted to believe in him. I want to think he's as good a guy as he is a passer. This is the right thing to say for any team to hear. Uh, we used to hear it. Uh, Brady lived it out in Boston, mm -hmm. by the way, by doing things like that. That's fine. And by the way, they're all rich. They're not going to suffer going to the grocery store the way an no, average person well, is with this well, inflation. So come on. Real quick, Bob, you, you alluded to Brady here. Do you credit the success the franchise and, of course, Brady Belichick had at that decision Brady made to not kind of go for number one or number two every year? It, it was clearly a contributing factor. They picked up crucial veterans along the way, and, and uh, it, it's common sense. They all should have taken That's the blueprint. David Dennis Jr., I'll bring you in here. I'm buying what Mahomes is saying because it's kind of easy to buy. The guy's making half a billion dollars in his second year of that contract. I mean, that's something. It's not like he's making a huge sacrifice for the legacy. We'll see what happens in three or four years when they talk about renegotiating that contract and he slides a little bit further down that list of highest paid quarterbacks and maybe has a Super Bowl ring or two. Then we'll see how altruistic he is about his contract versus Thank legacy when it's time to go for that negotiating table. You know, you just put up the GDPs of a few small countries right? on this yeah. planet and yeah. we're talking Back. about how much Back. money these guys are making. He is seventh, uh, of course, you, you want to be at the top of every list. You want to make the most money, most, win the most most rings, be with the best franchise, and all of that. And you know what? He's pretty close to all three of them. Right, so but Burrow and Herbert him. should jump him at some point in maybe this summer, right? So then you're the ninth? Possible. <laughs> Give him another million. Kevin Black, so Monica McNutt, thank you for your time today. Bob Ryan, David Dennis Jr., showdown in two minutes. A debate I'm not sure anyone's ever had before. A question I'm not sure anyone has ever asked aloud. Would you rather be GM of the Los Angeles Clippers or president of the Washington Wizards? Michael Winger is leaving the Clips for the Wiz. David, which team would you rather run, the Clippers or the Wizards? Okay, so sure, the Wizards have a long history of being bad, have a $200 million uh, player who doesn't want to get traded. They have not a lot of cap space, but at least they have some draft picks, I guess. Like, the, the Clippers have traded so many of their, their picks for Kawhi and PG. At least you have some picks for the Wizards. I think I'll take the Wizards, Bob job. Ryan, you with the Wizards or the Clippers? Well, in general terms, I think most people would say I'd rather take a shot with the, the Clippers as a team than the Wizards. But there's one thing. The Clippers are located in a city called Los Angeles where they seem to be forever 
forever the afterthought. No matter what they do, they had a window that was open. They couldn't get through that window, and now they're stuck with the Lakers again. I think he wanted to get the hell out Maybe, of Maybe, but the best basketball team in Washington is the Mystics. So, point. <laughs> David Dennis Jr., Texas A&M baseball coach Jim Schlossnagel. He said in-game interviews are bad luck. He thinks bad things are going to happen to his team when he's interviewed. Watch this. Give us two or three good innings. Um, if that can continue to swing, and let's, I have bad luck in these interviews. No, you, you got it. Look. Oh, see, it was. Talk oh, to you. Oh, see, oh, see, oh, see, oh, see, oh, see you later. Hey, goodbye. good talking goodbye. with you, Sloss. Uh, see, see you. Good luck or bad we'll luck. Good game interviews, Bob. Ever hear the phrase "self-fulfilling prophecy"? Well, that when uh, that was the ultimate in it. But that's a bit, that's a crybaby exit. So I'm sorry. That wasn't that bad a play. He had to run a long way. I don't know. Maybe he got dizzy. David Dennis Jr. <laughs> I love it. We need more of these. We need. He seemed to be a good sport about it. It was sort of a meaningless play, and we just got to enjoy his misery. Give me all of that as much as possible. Yeah, I, I love a walk-off interview. Just end it with a walk-off. Not, nothing more to say. David Dennis Jr., a walk-off win here. 30 seconds of face time. I am a fan of basketball podcasts. I love them. I can't get enough of them. And the podcast that has been on my mind and on my playlist the most lately is Paul George's podcast. I love it for one reason. He talks so much about all the times he gets whooped on a basketball court. And it's great. You want to know about uh, Clay scoring 61 points on him? He'll tell you about it. You want to know about getting swept by LeBron? He'll tell you. You want to get, try to guard Steph Curry and lose and have 50 points dropped on you? Paul George will tell you all about it. It's so open and so vulnerable. It's the best. He does have a self-deprecating way about him. Also, he does a podcast with the professor.